Hello and welcome to this special series of CIB in Conversation and another episode today. We're talking to the keynote speakers for the World Building Congress in June 2022, which we hope will see us all gather in, in Melbourne, Australia. Um, th big thank you to our sponsors for the Congress and, 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 and for this series of conversations. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Jacqueline Kramer from the Netherlands. Um, she's, uh, she has the title of professor. Uh, she's a former politician. And she now has a portfolio of senior and, and non-executive positions, all related to, to sustainability, um, which is, of course, a vitally important area of, of work central to CIB's mission and also a major theme of the World Building Congress. She's also uh, she's had a fascinating I mean, career, which I'll, which I'll try and get into a little bit. Jacqueline, welcome. Well, welcome. Yes, but be, be delighted to be here. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, and well, you know, we all have our fingers crossed that we'll all be able to get together in, in Melbourne in, in, in June. Yeah, um, for sure. So you're sitting there in, in, in Amsterdam. I, 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 get, I tried to give a quick overview there of your uh, role and activity. But let me start by asking you to, to say a little bit more about, about your current roles. Well, uh, I'm professor at the, uh, Utrecht University in the Netherlands. But besides that, I always prefer to work in practice as well. So I carry out a number of transition programs, which really aim for system changes in sectors, among which the building sector. Um, I'm, for instance, a chair of the concrete agreement, where we aim for ambitious goals in 2030 in terms of CO2 reduction, but also circularity and biodiversity. Um, furthermore, I am chair of the um, building agreement steel, which is quite similar to the concrete agreement. Uh, and furthermore, I'm also in other um, sectors active like the textile sector where i'm heading the circular textile valley in uh, the netherlands and also particularly in the amsterdam region um, furthermore i am very active uh, as the chair of the supervisory board of the holland circular hotspot because the netherlands uh, likes to join forces on circularity in uh, an international context. So uh, I also devote my time to uh, tell not only my experiences in the Netherlands, but share experiences with other countries and learn from each other. Uh, furthermore, and, and uh, then I stop, <laughs> I'm uh, also board member of the Amsterdam Economic Board. And I uh, started in 2015, a big program on circular economy uh, together with all kinds of parties, uh, among which of course the uh, business partners, but also uh, local government and communities and so on. So uh, that kind of practical work I use to write articles and books. <laughs> Well, and, and, and uh, clearly a very busy portfolio that, that, that you have there. You, you use this word transition. How do, uh, do you want to say a little bit more about what you mean or, what, or what's the sort of role of a transition broker as, as you see it? Well, all these changes we need to make now from a linear to a circular economy, from a fossil uh, energy-based economy to a... A non fossil, a renewable energy based economy, uh, we need to make system changes. It's not just a regular step by step incremental change for each uh, uh, individual company. No, it is a system change. And what does this, that mean? That means that you can only reach the targets together, which means cooperation in value chains. It means uh, cooperation at a local level. And you need each other to reach the results you want to achieve. I can provide, of course, various examples, but a very simple example uh, in the building sector is 
um, when we don't com uh, cooperate with the um, people that demolish buildings uh, and uh, say to them, you have to demolish in a circular manner, we can't use the materials again for an other life cycle. So uh, that's uh, one of the uh, examples. But in uh, designing new buildings, you need the designers to come up with new designs uh, where you take into account circularity, modularity, and also smart design. So there are many ways that you need each other, and not only in the uh, value chain as such, but uh, if, uh, for instance, local uh, government does not put certain requirements in the procurement uh, regulations uh, related to circularity, then there will be no market demand for change. So also a government should act upon the uh, goals uh, set. So it's a joint effort. And uh, the role I play is that I am transition broker, an intermediary, which has in principle no interest uh, yeah. at all. Uh, I try to get all the different interests aligned, aimed at the goals set we want to achieve. And uh, because this particular role is quite new, um, in the sense that it, it's not just manager of a project, no, it is being an orchestrator of a change process, a transformative change process. That's completely something else. So it means that you have to take quite some additional uh, uh, conditions and uh, other uh, challenges into account before you can really make the change you want. And, and uh, about the topic of a transition manager and also how you can make the transition. Well, I wrote quite some uh, articles and uh, uh, also two books about it. Uh, and I uh, promoted the idea that it's not only the uh, regular public governance that uh, should be in place, meaning we have to change our regulations, we have to uh, put in place additional uh, uh, economic uh, instruments, social instruments, uh, in, in, uh, innovation budgets and so on, the regular stuff that the, the government is supposed to do. But only that can't uh, make us move to a circular economy or to, to a sustainable economy. You also need what I call network governance. That means that you have to govern the networks that jointly have to um, uh, realize the changes necessary. Uh, so, uh, and uh, the, the network governance orchestration is done by transition brokers. So that's uh, the type of work I'm doing. And I, I love to talk about this topic also during the conference. Wow. Uh, and my topic will be how to govern uh, the transition to a, a circular building sector. So, uh, and not only to the sector, but a, a sustainable um, a building value chain, because it's not only the sector, but also the whole chain. Uh, so uh, that's what I like to address because people uh, still tend to think it is just a normal change process. And then my answer is no, that it, it's not. It is a transformative system change. And that's quite something else. Uh, it's possible, but you have to join forces. And um, well, so, let, so let's talk uh, a little bit more about this then in terms of your keynote presentation. So um, I think your title is How to Govern the Transition to a Sustainable Building, building Sector. Um, and, and you've given some introductions there. Do you want to uh, talk about a couple more of the key points that you'll be making in June? Well, um, when I talk about this topic, 
um, I will uh, in the first place say it's not just a technical issue. Uh, it is important uh, to uh, realize that a transformative change is a change of the institutional, behavioral, organizational, and economic, financial, legal change. So it's all together. And uh, it's fine, we have all kinds of um, technical uh, experts that can help us to move to a sustainable value chain, but uh, if not the other changes are made as well, then uh, it is not possible to make the change. So I will uh, address uh, what are the technical issues. Um, and uh, what I will say is, it's not only about the material, huh? whether you build in wood, in uh, uh, concrete or steel or whatever combination. Of course, there are differences, but my uh, message is all these materials should be improved. Um, they need to become much more CO2 uh, uh, in, uh, less in, in CO2 uh, emission than uh, at present. Uh, but uh, that's not only the thing. You also have to think about, okay, if you design and construct, how can you construct, in, and that's also still technical, that you uh, use as uh, prudently the uh, energy needed as possible. So it, um, and not only the energy, but also the materials and safeguard actually the uh, closing of uh, the loops as long as possible. Yeah. So design in view of circularity and of uh, the, uh, the, well, important uh, aspect of energy reduction and uh, renewables. Um, having said that, you need to organize the process, how you change from today to a tomorrow you don't know yet because not all the innovations are there. Otherwise, we would know what to do. But we need to put pressure on the system, on everybody, to think about the most promising new innovations that help us really to jump ahead. And to do that, you uh, need to develop a path which is not fixed. This is hard for technicians and also for business. And especially in the building sector, they like to uh, be certain about everything before they do one step. And what I say to the people in the industry, in the building sector is, this is not possible. We are on a journey that is hard to swallow because people say, on a journey, no, we, uh, we need to know what to do. I said, yes, but we have certain preconditions we need to fulfill before we make sure that we can do it. But we state we are going to do it and the conditions we are going to fulfill in the meantime. Okay, okay, that's fine as well. Then we have, again, uh, a feeling that we know what we are going to do. Yes, that's my uh, role, I say, that I try to guide you to a new system where the parameters are not so familiar yet. Because uh, normally when we change, we think of incremental changes that are already there, that are already possible, uh, but we, and we know we have to do it, and still, these are already difficult to make. I say, your main problem is a mental change. 
if you are willing to think in terms of we can do it, we can uh, set a man on the moon in our uh, sector, then you can achieve much more than when you think about every risk that you have to avoid. Well, that are the kind of things that I'm going to address on the basis of my own experiences in the Netherlands in the building sector. And, and you've begun to talk there about some of the challenges perhaps that you've faced in construction compared with, 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 with other sectors. Um, I mean, I was struck early on when you talked about um, value, you know, needing to collaborate at the value, yes. through value chains at the local level and so on and so forth, you know, to, to get better demolition was the example you gave. I mean, it's not a sector that's known for, for, for a high level of integration and, 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 and collaboration. So well, what's your experience been? And, and you know, um, uh, in your experience, how successful, how successfully are people able to um, embrace the ideas that you uh, are talking about here? Well, people understand that this behavioral change need, uh, needs to be made because they also see that the way the building sector is organized nowadays is quite inefficient. Yes. Um, and uh, also uh, cost a lot of extra money, which is actually a waste of money. So we talk about smart building and, uh, and design. Why? Because we think that our sector needs to move more to an industrial sector, uh, not in the, the sense that it becomes a, a, a chemical industry, no, yeah. but, but the kind of processes uh, uh, where possible with the ICT uh, support can be much more, become much more prudent and smart and therefore more efficient. And that's the, what I understand. Uh, and we will also put some requirements about that in the uh, procurement uh, guidelines, which will become obligatory in the Netherlands to follow. Uh, so the, uh, we try to create the, this uh, behavioral change also via the procedures that can help promote this change. Because you can say it, but it, it needs to be implemented via the systems they are familiar with. Well, so you're describing uh, the use of procurement as one of the key levers here, uh, yes. change. One, one of the working commissions, which has a parallel session at the World Building Congress, uh, is called procurement systems. And, and that is exactly their theme, their mission in life, if you like. So um, yeah. I'm sure these messages will land very well. And I'm sure it will generate a huge amount of interest uh, with, with uh, not least with that, that community. We also have a number of working commissions on all sorts of different aspects of um, uh, climate impact and uh, climate change and carbon and um, resilience and so on. So uh, I think you're going to find a very receptive uh, audience in, in, in June. Um, well, I'm uh, really uh, looking forward to share the experiences because I'm sure that, that uh, uh, I can also learn from other countries. Well, um, Thank you for that. Just before I um, uh, I let you go, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about your your um, your, your previous career um, because I know you were at one point uh, minister for housing uh, in the Netherlands. So, um, how was life as a politician? Well, quite different from the role I play now, because you're in the center of uh, the political uh, discussions and also the center of the media attention. Um, but uh, the, the kind of approach I followed is similar to what I just told. Right. Perhaps to uh, give an example, uh, I was also coordinator of the, a first um, uh, government broad climate change program 
uh, and uh, it was a program which I carried out with all ministers that had a relation to the theme of climate change. And I made sure that every uh, minister took their role and put in place uh, measures, uh, well, that uh, could improve the situation in the Netherlands. And um, in, in, uh, during that time, I also had to negotiate with my colleague on sustainable buildings. And uh, the first uh, round of negotiations, first meeting, was quite tough because the building sector said, why should we become more sustainable? And uh, we don't see a reason we build uh, beautiful houses and so on. And they were not inclined to move into the direction I proposed. Then I said to uh, the people, my staff, I, to, in the next meeting, I like you to invite some of the front runners in uh, the building sector that already show that it's quite possible to move from an energy, uh, uh, well, an, 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 a house uh, which consumes a lot of energy to a what we call a zero energy house. And it must be possible uh, in, and I started in 2007, to have in 2020, uh, all houses, new houses being built, energy zero. And I invited the, um, uh, the front runners in uh, the building sector, and I told the, the people uh, on the other side of the table, uh, well, I invited these people just to show you that do we don't think in terms of uh, today and tomorrow, but we think in terms of the, uh, the, the period till uh, 2030. And uh, your colleagues can tell you that it is quite feasible if you put it in a time frame to reach these goals and we can lower the bar every two or three years. And then in the end, in 2020, it must be zero. And all of a sudden they start to understand the message. And also the, that was a trigger that it is innovative, that it's not just a thing of the environment, but it was innovative, that it could also uh, motivate young people to join the building sector. So they had all of a sudden other reasons than just the, the climate change reason to get involved. And well, then I think, okay, it, 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 uh, if their reasons work, fine but then we continue and say okay we make the deal and so we made the deal the third um, negotiation round we uh, laughed to, uh, at each other and said we do it so that's the way i work normally that i uh, show that it is possible and that there are more reasons than just the environment to make this necessary transition to a circular economy or a renewable energy economy. And, and um, to uh, how important do you think it was that you were able to give a, um, a, a, a timetable that you were going to tighten the standards every, every three years o o over a number of years, you know, to give visibility of that forward yeah, that, that plan? Was, that was, in this case, also possible. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, it's not, not always possible, but here it was quite possible and feasible and it, yeah. it had worked. And it gives the industry time to plan and to plan for the major investment and yeah, uh, yes, to recruit yes. new people or, or yes. to make the capital investment, whatever they need yeah. to do. And, yes. and it's, it's yeah. uh, um, a, a, a sector uh, wide. Uh, and so there's no competition. Everybody has to adjust. Yes. So you're describing very much the um, a, a model which uh, could be 
um, linked to uh, the triple helix model of the integration or the collaboration between research and academia, industry and practitioners and government and, and, and policymakers and um, so. the collaboration that's necessary between those three stakeholder groups. So given- Yes, but, but one thing, that's what I call network governance, but I call it goal-oriented network governance. It is uh, not just to sit around the table and see how far we can come. No, it is very much focused and orchestrated by somebody who keeps track on that. Well, it, keeping your po politician's hat on for a minute, I, I, I often in this series find myself asking researchers what their key message would be to policymakers, you know, if they got to sit down with them. So turning that around, how, how can practitioners or, or researchers better get their messages across to policymakers? Um, well, in the Netherlands, that uh, uh, goes quite well, in, in fact. Um, um, you know, it is important that uh, you provide the politicians uh, uh, sharp uh, analysis, but brief. They, they can't read uh, thick reports or too complicated articles. So uh, you, you really have to show that you can put it in one pager. Uh, that sounds a little bit uh, funny, but uh, if the, uh, the politician trusts you, and they have to do that, uh, and otherwise they go to another expert, but uh, if this politician trusts you, then the, the politician accepts that I uh, that only the, the main facts are provided. But if you make a mistake or uh, it's it's uh, it it can be uh, uh, quite easily be criticized, then you will be out. So it's <laughs> quite delicate that you do a good job. And uh, that, that's what, what's important. And uh, do, do, do you have um, uh, language challenges? Do people speak to politicians in the right language, do you think? Do they speak to what's important to you as, as politicians? Well, you know, I had the problem myself that uh, scientists are used to, uh, well, be not too firm. They say, yes, this we can conclude, but this and this and this still has to be researched. And yes. uh, then the, the politician thinks, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I have to decide also wi without all this additional research. So um, how much, uh, notice do I have to, to take uh, 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 whether the, all the, the facts are uh, well enough to, to, set, to, to, to underpin your main message. Um, so we, we also always tend to be uh, too uh, uh, well careful not to say too firm what we think. But I learned in, in uh, my political uh, role that I just had to be quite simple in my wording. Um, also to journalists, you know, in the beginning I was saying, oh, and I explained everything and no, that's because this and this. And I thought, oh, no, 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 this is completely wrong. So uh, yeah, you have to learn to talk into a simple language. And that's quite hard because as a scientist, you don't want to, to uh, talk like that. And, um, but you can learn it, can't you? I mean, I mean, media training and so on. Uh, yeah, well, it took me, uh, well, a year or so. <laughs> really? <laughs> that yes, I, that yes. I all of a sudden saw my, myself on, on television and I think, oh, uh, this <laughs> is uh, quite uh, firm the way I, I now uh, respond. Also in, 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 uh, uh, parliament you know the, um, yeah 
Uh, I was also too friendly in the beginning. And I, oh yes, this is also <laughs> a problem. And no, this is not the case. And you know, I became firmer and firmer. <laughs> really, yes, fascinating. Um, Jacqueline, I can't believe we're, 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 we're running out of time. I've just got one, I got one more question that's just occurred to me, though. Well, as we speak, it's January 2022. We're still very much affected by the global pandemic. Um, in, in your field, in this field of um, transitioning to a sustainable building sector, you know, how um, uh, confident are you that, that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll achieve you know, uh, a direction of travel, which is positive. And do you think the pandemic will help the building sector make the transition or do you think it, uh, it might um, slow things down? Well, uh, it, it, it can slow down, but our problem in the Netherlands is that we uh, need to build and renovate but we don't have enough hands. We don't have enough employers to do uh, em uh, employees to do the work. Uh, that's our main problem. Because all the people go into ICT. That's why I promote the um, well, the, the smart building uh, movement. Because I think that we make must make more use of. The, the digital means in order to interest uh, new people to join the sector. You have touched on so many themes that are going to be uh, discussed in, in, in parallel sessions and so on at, at the World Building Congress. This has been a terrific overview. Thank you. Do you, do you would you like to uh, leave our viewers and, our, and the attendees with a final message of what to look forward to in, in June? Well, um, uh, audience, I hope to inspire you how we try to build a sustainable building sector together with the uh, partners. And that means uh, industry, at the, uh, also the government and uh, the local community. And uh, what I'd like to, to tell you is that it is not just a test technical endeavor. No, it is something we have to see in terms of a system change, which means that we uh, also need to change uh, economic and legal uh, measures, that we need to change our behavior, uh, the way we organize the building sector and how institutions work. Because at present, we work in a way that is uh, not sustainable in a more, uh, uh, what I call circular building sector. And uh, the whole idea of uh, sustainable building means that you really have to think about transformative changes, which implies much more than we currently are carrying out. Thank you so much. Oh, Jacqueline, thank you very much indeed. Um, you've shown that it's going to be a fascinating and stimulating session at the World Building Congress. I'm sure everybody looks forward to listening to you, but also engaging with you, meeting you. Uh, I certainly look forward to the conversations. And um, yeah, just thank you very much indeed. We look forward to seeing you in June. All right. Thank you. Thank you.